Good evening and welcome to Live from Prairie Lights. I'm Lindsay Park. Tonight I am pleased to present Writer's Workshop graduate C. J.C. Hallman, who will read to us and talk about his new book, Be and Me, A True Story of Literary Arousal. Philip Lopate says, J.C. Hallman has written his best, funniest, and riskiest book, one that flirts deliciously at the edge of obnoxiousness before darting off into deeper, sager truths. Every writer or would-be writer will find much to relish, wince at, and identify with here. J.C. Hallman grew up in Southern California. He studied creative writing at the University of Pittsburgh, the writing seminars at Johns Hopkins, and the Iowa Writers Workshop. He is the author of The Chess Artist, The Chess Artist, The Devil is a Gentleman, The Hospital for Bad Poets, In Utopia, and William and Henry. Hallman has also edited two anthologies, The Story About the Story and The Story About the Story 2, which propose a new school of literary response called Creative Criticism. Among other honors, he is the recipient of a 2013 fellowship from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. And we are very pleased to welcome here back to Prairie Lights in Iowa City and uh, happy to host this event for him. Uh, please welcome J.C. Hallman. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, it's good to see a number of folks out there who I imagine are students here, and I'm going to endeavor to change your minds about what writing about literature can be about, both in terms of what you write about and how you write about it. So this book um, starts with this line. What seems odd now at a remove is that I fell in love at pretty much the same time I forgot how to love books. And that sets in motion uh, a couple of different things. First is that part of the story I tell here is the story of my partner Catherine and I and how we meet and the story of um, our relationship as it goes through its ups and downs during the other part of the story, which is the reading of a writer named Nicholson Baker, hence B, B and me. And um, uh, the forgot how to love books part is is um, a reference to the to the fact that there, it's kind of that part of the book is sort of a story of a literary crisis, this immersion in the publishing world and the teaching world. It it um, affects how you think about literature, and it can kind of drain on you, and it can uh, it can it can wind up sending you or ch challenging your literary faith. So that part of the story is is uh, is very much. Um, um, about losing my literary faith, and then trying to get it back by setting out to read all the work of one author, somebody I hadn't read, and that is this guy, Nicholson Baker. Um, I had done these anthologies that were mentioned in the intro, in part because I was getting interested in how people write about literature, and I was wanting um, uh, to, to champion a kind of better writing about reading, the way that writers write about books. And... Um, uh, and I knew that this guy, Nicholson Baker, had written this important literary relationship story called You and I about his literary relationship with John Updike. But I hadn't read it, and I hadn't read Baker. And, um, uh, and I went into this crisis and experienced this, this kind of odd moment of thinking, you know, I need to do something. I need, I need something to change. And then kind of this guy's name kept popping up in my head. And, and eventually I just said, well, you know, I want to write, I would love to write a book, kind of a literary relationship book. And, um, and, you know, and, and maybe I should do it about this guy. So, you know, before I ever picked him up, I actually sat down and started writing the book and, uh, and eventually had this small body of work. And then of course I had to go to a publisher and say, well, look, there's this writer, Nicholson Baker, and I really like him, and, and he's, you know, he's really interesting, but, uh, you know, a lot of people haven't heard of him, and actually, I haven't read him either, but it's going to be great. Don't worry. And, uh, and so I had to get a publisher to sign on to that very speculative idea. And I was very fortunate to, um, uh, to have uh, Simon & Schuster uh, take that ride with me. 
And I'm going to read um, a section from kind of the middle of the book. And um, you need to know a couple of things about that. Um, and the first is that I'm going to be talking about two of Nicholson Baker's three sex books. Uh, he wrote uh, three books, Vox, uh, The Fermata, and House of Holes, all of which um, can be accurately described as a kind of literary pornography. The last of these is subtitled A Book of Ranch. So Baker himself has sort of embraced this idea. Mainly I'm going to be focusing on the first two. Uh, Vox is a, um, uh, a um, dialogue book uh, and it's a phone sex novel. The entire book is the story of a man and a woman engaging in a phone sex conversation. And that proceeds, begins, you know, with hello, you know, what's your name? And it ends pretty much as you'd expect a phone sex conversation to end. Uh, so it's not trying to be, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, at least structurally, uh, it, it is pretty predictable. And it is a dialogue book. It is a man and woman speaking to each other. And the Fermata is, um, has got a lot of similar material, but it's the story of a, um, uh, a young man who develops kind of a magical ability to stop time. And he mainly uses this ability to undress people and do things to them. And, and uh, both of those books came out in the mid-90s, and uh, they were back-to-back. -back. And I'm going to be reading about those two books. And, um, uh, and the other part that you need to know is where this kind of comes in the story of my relationship with Catherine, because I'm going to be going back and forth between, um, between discussing Baker and, and, and our lives. And... Uh, the book starts in St. Paul when Catherine comes to, to join me there when I'm living there. And then before long, we move to Oklahoma. And so I, I say in the book that we move from Fitzgerald's to Jodes because, of course, St. Paul, Fitzgerald, and Oklahoma is the Jodes and from Grapes of Wrath. And, and, um, uh, and um, Oklahoma was really hard on us. You know, I moved down there for a teaching job and because I wanted to be working with graduate students instead of undergrads. And Catherine dutifully went along with me, and it was really, really hard on her. Oklahoma is just a really tough place. To give you some idea, you know, we moved down there at the end of June 2011. And July 2011 was promptly the hottest month on record in any state in recorded history ever. Average daytime temperature of 109 and it was flicking up to 117 some days. It was amazing. And, and then, of course, there's fracking earthquakes, and there's flash fires, and there's coyotes, and it was just, it was just awful. And so part of what we did um, is, is um, we decided to go to Paris uh, to alleviate some of our Oklahoma problems. And, um, and Catherine has been a long Francophile, and so she was, you know, very anxious to go. And, and so I, 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 at this point, I was already reading Nicholson Baker, and I was having a great time in Oklahoma. I was writing my book, and, and everything was wonderful for me. And I said, well, okay, we'll go to Paris, and I'll read, um, uh, I'll read Baker's sex books there. That was my plan. And, um, and of course, you know, the time in Oklahoma had taken its toll on our relationship. And so when we got to Paris, and I'm not going to begin right in the middle, I'm at the beginning of the Paris section, it's a little ways in. And, um, but um, when we got there, I suggested to Catherine that what we do is we, um, that we read Vox together. We'd done a lot of reading together out loud when we were, you know, early part of our relationship. And, and so I said, well, I'll have a copy and you'll have a copy. And I'll read the male part and you'll read the female part. And I thought, well, that's to be like our sexy little game, you know, and, and maybe this will help us kind of get our relationship back on track. And, um, and she was, you know, very suspicious of this and the truth is we sat down to start and we went back and forth for about a page and a half and she just dropped the book in her lap and said it's male whack-off fantasy <laughs> and she just refused to go any further and that's where this picks up then again Vox has something of a dubious history of people attempting to share it a history that I was surprised once I finally heard it wasn't the first thing I'd heard about Nicholson Baker. For many people, it may be the only thing they've heard about Baker. For obvious reasons, Vox was the first of Baker's books to receive a truly robust publicity campaign. 
And on publication, it climbed to number three on the New York Times bestseller list and remained in the top ten for several months. This meant that many people who hadn't previously read Nicholson Baker, people perhaps looking for Rabelaisian abandon, read Vox. Among these, it's safe to say, was Monica Lewinsky, the one-time White House intern whose affair with President Bill Clinton led to Clinton's impeachment and tarnished the Clinton legacy such that it became one of a number of factors contributing to the outcome of the 2000 presidential election. It's not known when or how Lewinsky became aware of Vox, but it is known that, toward the end of her affair with Clinton, famously composed of about ten mostly oral encounters in or near the president's private study and, notably, a number of lengthy phone calls, Lewinsky gifted Clinton her personal copy of Vox and quickly purchased a replacement. A few weeks later, on Valentine's Day 1997, she placed a personal ad in the Washington Post, a quotation from Romeo and Juliet about true love overcoming impossible obstacles. She cut out and pasted the ad onto a thin piece of cardboard that she gave to Clinton as a bookmark, and later testified that she saw the bookmark in Clinton's copy of Vox on a further visit to the private study. Clinton never admitted to having received the book, even when he was subpoenaed and pressured, and prosecutors later introduced into evidence an October 1997 inventory that listed Vox among the study's collection of books. Surely it would be unfair to suggest that the so-called Lewinsky affair, and all the history that sputtered along after it, can or should be laid at the feet of Nicholson Baker. Yet it would be just as unfair to ignore the fact that something like the Lewinsky affair seems not to have been particularly far from Baker's mind as he wrote Vox and the Fermata. That story begins about 20 pages after the story of Jim of Vox's ejaculations on page 9 of Vox, when he confesses to Abby that the initial impulse to call the phone sex hotline they've both called traces back to a moment in a video rental store about an hour and a half before he picked up the phone. Rentals rented, Jim tells Abby, he had been exiting the store when he noticed an elaborate display for Disney's film adaptation of Peter Pan. A television was showing the film on continual loop, and Jim happened to glance at the screen at a moment when Tinkerbell pauses mid-flutter and glances down at her small-breasted, big-hipped frame in a quite womanly way, an important distinction for Jim. He suggests that the sequence that follows, in which Tinkerbell tries to fly through a keyhole but gets stuck because her hips are too wide, is the inspiration for a scene in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, in which Marilyn Monroe finds herself similarly lodged in a ship porthole. It's this sequence of Vox, this association, from Tinkerbell to Marilyn Monroe, from children's story to sex symbol, that serves both as the occasion of Vox, the reason Jim calls the phone sex line, and aligns it with Nicholson Baker's broader goal of challenging the age and genre boundaries that have chopped a chaotic network of flaws into the once pure gemstone of literature. It's not just Tinkerbell, either. It's Alice in Wonderland again, too. Long before House of Holes repeatedly echoed Alice's plunge down a hole to a wacky civilization, the Fermata, to leap slightly ahead here, and I should acknowledge that there's absolutely no evidence that Monica Lewinsky read the Fermata, proposes that the basic template of Alice's adventures in Wonderland is all we really need to know about how reading and writing ought to work in the world. To slow down a bit. Baker's sex books mostly obey the usual constraints of the pornography genre. Episodic sexual encounters featuring varying combinations of participants and activities, all strung on a loose narrative frame. But while the plots of ordinary pornography tend to be throwaway or comedic pastiche, the interstices of Baker's sex books hint at aesthetic vision. For example, in addition to its series of time-stopped sexual fantasies, the Fermata is also the story of 35-year-old temp worker Arno Strine's literary career. Like Jim recalling his pivotal moment in a video store, Arno traces his literary impulse, an impulse which results in the Fermata, back to a moment in college when he gave in to an impulse to share with others Lisa Alther's Kinflix, a book of canonical 1970s erotica. He purchased several copies of the book and left them lying around campus like Easter eggs, hoping that someone would pick up a copy and read it. 
the draw of this was that it turned him into a partially empowered puppeteer. His explanation returns to Alice in Wonderland. I'm captivated, Arno writes, by the simple idea of putting something into the path of a woman so that she can choose to look at it and read it, or on the other hand, choose to walk on by. In short, Arno is more reader than writer at this stage in his literary development. We all begin as readers, trying to share our reading experiences. But soon enough, Arno realizes that the pleasure he takes in distributing books would be heightened if a woman were to encounter my very own words. He goes on to reveal that he had acted on this impulse only quite recently, and for the rest of the book, he stops time so that he has enough time to write erotic stories that he then places in the paths of a series of surrogate Alice's. Of note at this point is the character Joyce in the Fermata, a co-worker whom Arno idolizes and to whom he eventually reveals the secret of his time-stopping power. Toward the end of the Fermata, Joyce acquires this power herself, and we hear of her using the ability to catch up on work, strip random strangers, and make herself a better sexual partner for Arno. Most important for our purposes, she talks of taking a jaunt down to Washington and sucking the presidential dick. What's the lesson of all this? All books are written for Alice's, Monica Lewinsky included and perhaps Lewinsky more than most, in that she too has come to be associated with a dress of a particular shade of blue. I imagined Nicholson Baker observing all this from afar and snickering in a private sense of fiendish accomplishment. It is encouraging that a novel can still become controversial enough to amount to evidence in a legal battle with wide-ranging historical implications. But even if the ripple effects of Vox ought to rank it among history's most influential books, it has to be allowed that its influence, like Thomas More's Utopia or Machiavelli's The Prince, has been a function of readers not having bothered to fully understand it. This was equally true of those who liked the book and those who disliked it. On the one hand, there probably is a fruitful analogy to be made between pornography and ambitious literature, e.g. Neither, neither is driven by plot alone, both are kept in home libraries for ease of reconsultation, etc. But to completely erase the difference between literature and porn, as Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton had done, is pretty obviously a flawed interpretative technique. And on the other hand, the reaction of those who disliked Vox, including many of its early reviewers, was just as flawed, though the reasons for this are somewhat more complicated. What's the purpose of book reviews these days? Should reviews mostly summarize books so that readers can decide for themselves whether a book's contents merit further investigation? Though such reviews tend to pirate books' best information and thereby become, com and thereby become competing condensed versions of them? Should reviewers mostly celebrate Brooks, rouse crowds whose attention is tugged at by a whole range of less demanding media, though the absence of any critical sense leaves even praise feeling hollow and unearned? Or should reviews stand sentinel against mediocrity, individual reviewers accepting a kind of knighthood of taste that empowers them to scold the literary community as it strays from quality and ambition, though such power has the tendency to run amok? such that a too strident review can both quash a promising career and make a pariah of the reviewer in the process. In You and I, Nicholson Baker advises against writers becoming reviewers at all, and in this he may have taken his cue from Henry James's The Figure in the Carpet, in which a newly successful novelist harumphs, I don't review, I'm reviewed. But the truth is that Baker did eventually review, albeit with more personality than reviewers are generally encur encouraged or permitted to exhibit. But he's kind of an exception. What reviews are still published these days tend to suffer on at least three fronts. One, they tend to be so short that thematic threads stretching between a writer's books cannot be properly addressed. Two, lacking hindsight. Early reviewers too often amount to a first line of defense resisting change to the status quo. And three, reviewers are often compelled to interview, and, and therefore they lack the enthusiasm of a volunteer reader. <laughs>
In one way or another, all of these problems manifested in the initial poor reviews of Vox, which appeared among scattered positive notices. A brief sampling of the vitriol. The New York Times. Vox doesn't aspire to use graphic descriptions of sex to make any sort of larger point. While it's titillating enough, it's not particularly revealing or emotionally involving. The Washington Post. While Jim and Abby are fully imagined characters, they become comparatively unrealized during the more extreme pornographic parts of the novel in the way that hapless sex renders all of us cartoons. The Globe and Mail. Baker is ultimately trapped by the vulgarity of his subject. Jim and Abby are obsessed by personal gratification to the exclusion of everything else. The Gazette. I cannot recall the last time I was this disappointed in a writer or felt so strongly that I had better things to do than I did while I was reading Vox. The Independent. I hope that Nicholson Baker now moves on to matters more robust, leaving this study of infantilism well behind him. It's too easy, I think, to chalk these responses up to jealousy of a youngish and already much respected writer having suddenly become a bestseller. The criticisms echo too closely the themes of the book itself, children's stories, titillation. The objection was not that Vox was obscene, but that it was vulgar in Henry James's sense of the word, and the critics simply refused to acknowledge that its vulgarity reflected a culture itself becoming more obvious and simple. In other words, critics panned Vox because they hoped it was wrong, and that hope made them incapable of the negative capability that, it, that is literature's only prerequisite and to which Nicholson Baker's negative space had already pointed. I thought back on my fight with Catherine over our aborted Vox reading. When I had argued that House of Holes had not struck her as a male jerk-off fantasy, that, in fact, it seemed to have worked just fine as an emotional lubricant, she claimed that it had been just that one time and that it had been spontaneous. I countered that a capacity for repeated re-enjoyment with no loss of intensity or pleasure was yet another point of contact between good porn and good books, but she would have none of it. She accused me, essentially, of approaching the business with Lewinsky and abandon. Untrue. Rather, I had hoped that we could use the books to increase our overall intimacy. Nicholson Baker, I said, could help us redraw a line from the harmony of our intellectual lives to the sensual bond of our physical lives, enriching both like a good simile. Instead, Nicholson Baker, Baker became in Paris the name of the place we could not go. People started dying in Paris. Or scratch that. People started dying while we were in Paris. Christopher Hitchens died, and then two days later, Kim Jong-il died, and then the day after that, combining the two, Vaclav Havel died. These deaths hit me with a kaleidoscopic sense of shifting history. The world was different now, which was perfect because Paris, fairly round on maps, looks a whole lot like a kaleidoscope image. You only ever stumble across places you hope to find in Paris. In fact, you have to plan on stumbling across places because it's useless to study those kaleidoscopic maps. You look up from the map to the city, and it's as though in that instant someone has twisted the tube and now it's all different. That's why Catherine and I hadn't bothered to seek out Shakespeare and Company, Paris's famous bookstore. We had planned to stumble across it. And in our second week, late at night after a long day at Versailles, we did stumble across it, by which I mean we practically stepped into a puddle of votive candles, burning before the store's front door, a shrine laid out for its famous owner, George Whitman, who had died earlier that day. Whitman did die in Paris, and now everything was different in the literary world. I was feeling different, too. About ten days before I'd left for Paris, I'd noticed that a small lump on my back, a lump that had been there for a couple years but didn't particularly bother me, had begun to grow. Grow was exactly the right word for it, because the lump caused me no discomfort, yet I could feel it filling with something, growing. I used a mirror to look at it, and after I looked at it, I decided to get it looked at. My doctor told me not to worry. But I'm going to Paris for a month, I said. It's no big deal, she said. 
What is it? A growth. I know that, I said. It's a cyst, she said. Think of it as a big pimple. It's coming to the surface. What if it comes to the surface in Paris, I said. It won't. What if it does? She wrote me a prescription for an antibiotic that shrank my growth for a while. But after I'd been in Paris for about a week, I started to notice it again. My growth had laughed in the face of that antibiotic. My growth was like a mountain climber determined to summit the surface of my skin, and it would not be deterred by poor conditions. Before long, I began to feel less a sensation of growing than a generalized twanging. And if I leaned back against anything, a pillow, say, I experienced shooting tendrils of pain that flickered out to my fingers and tweaked the base of my neck. It was my zit to bear, and I bore it. I bore it everywhere, up hills and down them, up to Sacre Coeur, for example, and back down again. Before long, I wasn't merely reacting to pain, but wincing and twitching my shoulders in anticipation of it, hunching my back, that was the only word for it, to accommodate my ever-bulging and now quite painful growth. Oddly, the pain grew more pronounced. The closer I happened to be to the center of Paris, I became more and more hunchbacked the closer I was to Notre Dame. When I revealed this to Catherine, a text message sent from a brasserie called La Reserve de Quasimodo, she thought it was perfect because I'd been suffering from the figurative growth of my irrepressible pessimism for years now and because I'd been crazily vaulting around Paris late at night and because it enabled her to express everything she'd been feeling in all the months leading up to Paris. She'd been kidnapped and dragged to Oklahoma against her will and she felt imprisoned and hopeless and despondent and sad. Truth be told, Catherine wasn't feeling all that well herself in Paris. In her second week, she'd become sick, overcome by clogs of mucus in her sinuses. I'd noticed that most sexy French women were sexy because they had a slight overbite that made them look as though they were looking down their noses at everything. Now that Catherine was having to do a lot of head tipping to keep her nose from running, she really was looking down her nose at everything, and she wound up appearing a whole lot more French as a result. This cheered her up, miserable though she was, but it was only a temporary happiness because, of course, she would get better. Paris was a related problem because it was temporary, too. By this point, we'd fallen in love with the adorable atelier we'd rented, and this was sad because being happy in Paris meant that we no longer had Paris to look forward to, and before long we'd be headed back to Oklahoma with, and with few prospects for the future. Late one evening, as we lay side by side on the futon, Catherine sniffling and paging through a book of Sophie Call's Hasselblad images, which I had stumbled across at Shakespeare and Company, and myself terrifiedly viewing online videos of subcutaneous cyst removals, <laughs> think of eclairs pounded with sledgehammers, spores bursting in slow motion, a volcano's molten belch, or, it has to be admitted, male ejaculation, we paused to consider what trip we would go on next to plot our next escape. Paralyzed by despondency, Catherine had no productive ideas. I did, but I hesitated, because it meant possibly breaking the ironclad resolution I made, I had made when I started writing about Nicholson Baker. Then I just said it. How about Maine? Baker was in Maine. Long story short, Nicholson Baker grew up in Rochester, went to school in Philadelphia, one year abroad in France, Lived for a few years in New York and Boston before his career started to take off. Spent most of the 90s in California. His father-in-law taught at Berkeley for half a century. Relocated his family to England for a year for reasons that were still unclear to me. And then settled in South Berwick, Maine, where he'd lived since 1998. Even before learning all this, I'd taken note of the fact that writers moved to Maine with surprising regularity. It was no Paris, but Maine seemed to rank high among desirable sites from which to conduct a literary life. Not ever having been there, I had no idea why. This alone seemed worth investigating, and just before I told Catherine my idea, I told myself that being in Maine did not require me to profane my quest by trying to meet Nicholson Baker. Catherine agreed, not with whether I should meet Baker, but with, with the proposal in general. I'd love to go to Maine, she said. Using vacation time to plan future vacations is the state of modern life. <laughs>
I set to work sifting through images of summer rentals on Maine's southern coast and learned there was exactly one bed and breakfast in South Berwick, Maine. The next day, I had my hunchback removed. I had to stumble across L'Hôpital Americain de Paris because even if I could have read my Paris map, the hospital wasn't on it. Happily, the hospital turned out to be located on Avenue Victor Hugo. The hunchback removal process was made pleasant by the fact that French nurses sacrificed nothing of fashion to the sterility required of invasive surgical techniques. Scrubs turned out to be a delightful complement to the dangly earrings and artful makeup long championed by overbitten French women. The whole episode nicely anticipated a scene near the end of the fermata. Arno volunteers for a medical study on masturbation-induced carpal tunnel syndrome and fantasizes at length, aloud, about his sexy doctor while she studies him masturbating in the womb-like space of an MRI machine. I say anticipated because at that point, on the day I had my growth milked, I was only about a third of the way into the fermata. Pre-procedure, I spent 45 minutes reading the book in an examination room, and my laughter at the funny parts flitted out into the hallway, where elderly French people, who weren't even on their last legs because they were on gurneys, were being wheeled from room to room. Does the questionable appropriateness of exuberantly reading a body book in the solemn enclave of an emergency room speak to the larger question of whether Bake Baker's sex books are inappropriate, as reviewers suggested? Perhaps. It's true that the trilogy is unwilling to consider the darker side of its subject. For example, the first real-life porn star mentioned in Vox, one of the tapes, Jim says, has got Lisa Melendez in it, who I think is just delightful, died of AIDS in 1999 at the age of 35. Also, while no one tends to get hurt as a result of popular storytelling genres, there is a compelling argument to be made that pornography feeds patriarchy, and that female porn stars in particular are conscripted into the business and compelled to have sex for pay. This is quite similar to book reviewers being forced to critique books they did not choose to read. And while reviewers and sex workers both might take umbrage at the suggestion that they have been coerced, it's worth noting that only sex workers already have, having once picketed appearances by scholar Catherine McKinnon, who once claimed that female porn stars were oppressed and that all sex is rape. For me, though, the fact that Baker's sex trilogy was fantasy, that the books were about fantasy, inoculated them, them against that kind of vulgar criticism. We have well enough of that other sick-souled, to use William James's phrase, view of our sexual lives. Why not a little healthy-mindedness, a little looking on the sexy side? If one of the problems of modern life is that, like reviewers who have forgotten how to fill negative space, we no longer know how to intimately empathize with one another, then perhaps a fantasy depicting intimate empathy should not be criticized for failing to represent a reality it never tried to resemble. That's the hole you're looking for, a woman in House of Holes says, when she reveals that her vagina is yet another portal to the House of Holes. And what she means is that sexual fantasy is a place to which those whom modern life has left feeling abducted or conscripted or imprisoned might occasionally escape. Or perhaps I was thinking all this only because soon, after the doctor arrived and sliced open my hunchback and pinched it empty of every last dollop of malicious infection, I was left with a quite large hole in myself. Known formally as a cavity wound, it was tricky, this hole. Infected once, it was susceptible to relapse and needed to heal slowly from the inside out like the socket of a pulled tooth. What this meant was that every other day, for the rest of my time in Paris, I returned to Avenue Victor Hugo so comely French nurses could lie me down and stuff medicated gauze deep into my negative space. Which makes total sense, because Abby of Vox, of course, was another Alice en route to Wonderland, and she, too, has a preternatural attraction to holes. Early in Vox, Abby claims that she enjoys the negative space of dialogue. 
the accidental pauses into which the imagination reflexively plunges. A few pages later, there comes a critical instance of just such a chat hole. Jim is describing a streetlight outside his window. The light had begun turning itself on just a moment before. He goes about his description quite patiently, because the light itself doesn't just flick to life like an incandescent lamp. It's a slow process. For a time, he explains, you can't even be sure the light is coming on at all. It could be the space around the bulb getting darker. Then there's this moment, he says, when the street light is the exact color of the sky, and that gives the illusion of a hole in the middle of the tree across the street. Then we get this. There was a pause. Listen, Abby said, this is getting expensive at a dollar a minute or whatever it is. Ninety-five cents per half minute, I think, Jim says. So give me your number and I'll call you back, she said. There was a pause. What do our imaginations project into this particular negative space? After the pause, Abby's voice has a tone of urgency, and her concern over the call's cost suggests that she now realizes that the conversation is going to last significantly longer than she originally planned. Jim's description of an illusory whole is neither vulgar nor obscene, yet for Abby it's decisive. It convinces her that Jim has something unique to offer, that his is a sensibility with which her own might chime. Jim talks her out of hanging up. The risk that they might not reconnect is too great, he says, and anyway, two dollars a minute is great value. Some pages further on, far enough down the road so that part of what we register is the fact that Abby stored this moment away in memory. She reintroduces the whole theme in a story. She tells Jim about masturbating to a fantasy of repainting her apartment. And then I thought, she says, wait, I have the money, this time I'll hire people to paint it for me. And so three painters materialized. And then suddenly there was a large hole in the wall, about three feet off the floor, big enough so that I could fit through so that my legs were standing in the front hall, and yet my head and upper body were in the living room. The hole was finished off and lined with sheepskin. I had nothing on. Actually, this is a fantasy of a story of a fantasy, because Abby is jammed into a hole like Tinkerbell and Marilyn Monroe for Jim's benefit. The scene that follows is certainly titillating enough, as that one hostile reviewer remarked. The painters apply stripes of sun-warmed paint to Abby's butt cheeks and legs, and then there's a lengthy sequence in which the masturbating Abby envisions herself pleasuring three men at once. But to end a reading of the scene at titillation is to make the same mistake Jim makes when Abby's story is finished. He guesses that the trifecta of fantasy orgasms, then all three of them came in me, Abby says, one right after the other, first the one in my mouth, surprisingly enough, then the one in my pussy, then finally the one in my ass, that this, Jim makes the mistake of thinking, was what permitted Abby to bring herself to actual orgasm. The next sequence is crucial. Not at all, Abby explains. That was just a picture, one image among many. And what had actually made her come was a pair of ideas. And for several pages, she tries to communicate what these ideas are. But the conversation gets sidetracked before she ever gets to them. In other words, Abby's story is an attempt to depict the working of her mind, which she can't explain in any other way. That she fails to explain it is important. But regardless, the incorporation of Jim's fantasy into her own is a tender way of answering Jim's earlier call for a stream of confidences flowing from you to me. Stream of confidences? This is so close to stream of consciousness that all serious readers, perhaps not Monica Lewinsky, but certainly professional reviewers, ought to be expected to suspect from just this, that while the ostensible subject of Vox might be phone sex, what it's really about is storytelling and the purpose of literature. To make the case a little clearer, Abby's aggressive honesty, impress me with your candor, she says, leads to an odd admission. Not only does she like holes, she has bizarre fantasies about passing through them. Specifically, she imagines getting sucked into the engine of an SR-71 Blackbird, one of those black secret spy planes, she says, and instantly becoming a long fog of blood. 
This is a peculiar fetish, to be sure, and actually it's a subset of an even more general fantasy in which she dematerializes herself so that she can pour down into the grids of holes in telephone handset mouthpieces. Neither the plane nor the dematerialization kill her, she assures Jim. And what's important is what it feels like to be turned into some kind of conscious vapor. The body is no longer a solid. It can whoosh or stream. This perhaps explains Abby's unique attraction to bodies of water. I'd put out for any body of water at all, she says, a pool or a bath or a pond or an ocean. Importantly, this follows a peculiar admission of Jim's own. What he fetishizes is advances in book technology. Most recently, a mechanical spreading device that splays paperbacks wide for hands-free reading. Jim had masturbated, he says, while reading about the new device. All of this is critical in the larger context of Baker's career, in that what should be clear by now is that Jim and Abby embody Baker's transition from mechanical to organic cognitive metaphors. And the fact that everyone who travels to the House of Holes does so via a process quite similar to what Abby describes in a book published 18 years later tells us not only that the evolution is from a Jim-style worldview to an Abbey-style worldview, it insists that whatever is being described is lodged deep in an abiding worldview of Nicholson Baker. Thank you. <laughs> so you have to be brave to ask questions about this, this book, but I would be happy to address any brave questions. <laughs> Um, terrific reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. My comment. Um, as I'm reading the first part of your book, I kept thinking about a recent funny and heartbreaking article in the New York Times written by a, a so-called Hollywood insider, you know, somebody who's done various sorts of screen, screenwriting work and such. And the title, I believe, was Welcome to L.A., the city where everyone hates movies. And you may have seen it yourself, but he said, I, I go to this movie and I think, oh, yes, that's the producer that lied to me. Go to this one and I can tell that they switch screenwriters right in this scene and, and it's awful. It's a whole nother tone. And he can't enjoy movies anymore. Mm -hmm. And I thought of your crisis in, the, in that light, How but, <laughs> yeah. but I thought yours, well, it's a novel, but I thought yours went deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not a novel, a uh -huh. book. Uh -huh. And could you talk about that, how it's not just learning the mechanics of the industry and how those are flawed like mechanics everywhere? Sure. Um, uh, well, um, I often go to a story, uh, <laughs> um, and actually, I was, it was a Paris Review Party. It was Charlie's Paris Review Party years ago, uh, and um, I was, I was uh, at this Paris Review Party, and I wound up in a conversation with an agent, Michael Shaven's agent, and, um, and it was just before Wonder Boys was coming out. And, um, and, and the agent was just thrilled with this cover. Um, and and um, she was going on and on about the cover of the book and how excited she was. And, and, I, and I was like, yeah, yeah, wow, the cover, that just sounds fantastic. And then eventually you realize that you're actually sitting there judging the book by its cover, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and... Yeah. Um, and, and this is pretty common for, you know, for the New York publishing parties because everybody's very deeply immersed in it. And I think the shock, uh, you know, for, for any writer, you know, is that, you know, you, you, th you, um, first you might suspect, you know, as you're, you know, kind of getting introduced to literature and, and, and making your first forays into it is, is that it's going to be a meritocracy. Seems like it is. It really isn't, you know, and, and then you get, you get really, um, surprised by the fact that it's a business, you know, and, um, uh, and I know, I know for me anyway, it, w it was you know, part, part of the, f the feeling that, that, uh, of wanting to become a writer because it felt insulated from all of that. And of course, that's very naive, right? And, um, and so, um, 
the, it's it's very surprising when you when you actually sell your first book, um, to then realize that now you don't own it. <laughs> you know that you think of it as your book, um, but really you're cut, you're sort of the star in a movie that someone else is making, and um, uh, and and that it's it's a shock and it takes a while to get used to. And um, and this thing that you think you have control over, or that you should have control over, you really don't, you know. And so, um, you know, things like the cover, things like the title, things like the subtitle, you know, they're not really your decisions. They see, you know, sometimes we'll talk about books as though they're all the author's decisions, and I do too, even. But the truth is, is is that a lot of the time they're not. I was once in a in a conflict with my second book with my publisher about the title and subtitle of the book. And, you know, whenever you, you make too much noise as an author, um, you, 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 you begin to be difficult. And, and then they threaten you with a conference call, right? And so, you know, uh, I wound up on this conference call with my editor and an agent and, and then what they called the number two at the publishing house, right? And I was supposed to be really impressed with the number two, you know. And so the number two came in. We all on the, we're all on this call and we're talking about the title and the subtitle. And... Um, uh, and I said something that I thought was pretty smart. I, well, at first, I'm like, you know, feeling like it feels like multi-ball in a pinball machine. You know, I'm talking to all these different people and I'm sort of holding it all together for a little while and I feel like I've got control over it. And, and then I thought I made what I thought was a really cogent point. Um, and I said, well, I don't want us to settle for a title that's really catchy, but which misrepresents the book. And there was this pause. And then the number two said, I don't care if the title misrepresents the book. And there was like a long pause as though everybody but me was just thinking, you don't ever tell the writer that, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and I think, you know, so I, I think that there is, um, you know, uh, ways in which, you know, getting introduced to the publishing industry really challenges some of your fundamental motives for, for being a writer in the first place and that this can, you know, as was the case with me, challenge your literary faith and make you question some of the assumptions that you have about books. And, and of course, the solution for that is not to, not to go on to some other industry, you know, but to read, to read more deeply, to read in a new way. And, and so that was what I set out to do, to, you know, to, 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 reject everything that I that I that I knew I knew about the publishing industry and nevertheless immerse myself in um, uh, in a writer whose whose work was seeming to call out to me in that kind of mysterious way that, that I don't think has anything to do with the business of books and it felt earnest and organic and and it was it was it was a faith rejuvenating process so there's a happy happy ending in the end Thank you. Thank you. So, did you ever actually get to meet Baker? I did. I did, and I tell the story. Um, at first, I was I was very hesitant to 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 set out to meet a writer, and I worried that maybe. Um, you know, uh, Baker had said in his book, You and I, that, that reading is like a friendship. You know, or he said it's like having an imaginary friend. And in this, he was picking up from Proust, who compared our relationship with writers to friendship uh, in, his, in his famous essay on reading. And, um, and I thought, well, when I was reading Baker, and, and he was saying, well, right, having, having a relationship with a writer is like having an imaginary friend. And I, and I kind of, I, I wanted to believe that, yeah, but, you know, your relationship with the writer, it needs to remain imaginary. Right to actually encounter them is to maybe challenge the reason why you're interested in them in the first place. Right? We uh, we 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 get in um, in books we get a writer's best self, whereas in real life we see their public persona, and there's sometimes a conflict between the two. And um, uh, and so I was hesitant to seek him out. But then I decided that when you're writing about somebody, you know, that, that I believe that, that a, a writer has jurisdiction over their work. That if you want to talk, if you want to say something about their work, you can just go and talk to them about what it's about. And, and that, you know, whether that's in essays, you know, whether it's Henry James having write, uh, written famous prefaces to his works 100 years ago, um, or whether they're still around, whether they're still alive. Either way, you can go to the source and talk to them. And then I use that as, as, as kind of the rationale for actually going to Maine. So Catherine and I go to Maine, you know, we actually spend a week in a bed and breakfast uh, in Baker's hometown. And, and, um, and I called him, 
And it was a long, after a long, fretful period of not knowing what to do or say. And because at this point, I've been reading this guy for two years, you know, and and, um, and um, I met with him a couple of times um, and we had we had a couple of lunches. And uh, and he's a he's a really fascinating guy, an incredibly kind presence, and um, and um, something perfect happened. You know, the second time I got together with him, something that really sort of captured him as both a writer and a thinker. And I'm not going to tell you what that was, <laughs> but it but it it really kind of it, it made for a sort of perfect climactic moment for the book, and I and I love that it happened. You know, it's a book about reading. It's not like there was a train wreck at the end or anything. You know, so it's not a huge drama. You know, but but uh, but this w this one thing happened that was just the most perfect thing. And um, uh, and you know, and, and your your uh, a probable follow up is that is is that Baker um, has seen the book and and wrote me the kind of email about it that you would sort of love to have tattooed on you somewhere. You know, and and yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, uh, and. This Right, yeah, I should get it, I should get it tattooed there, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, um, but as well, he he also knew about the book at the proposal stage. I wasn't told this, um, but my publisher went to him and said, "There's this book, and it's got some stuff in it. It's probably going to make you pretty uncomfortable," and uh, and he signed off on it. And so he was he uh, kind of you know took that risk along with the publisher as well as to, as to what I was doing. Uh, JC, I wanted to ask um, real quick. Now, you um, you said you had not read any of his work. Does uh -huh. that include you and I? You had not read that. Yeah, I hadn't read anything. Okay, you know, and um, uh, and so you know, um, I I went through this. You know, so I did these anthologies of of creative criticism. And I kind of knew of you and I. I had a faint understanding that it was one of these important literary relationship things. And so I published the first of the two anthologies. And um, kept having ex these experiences of Baker's name popping into my head, or hearing him on the radio, or seeing reviews everywhere. And I realized I was kind of actively avoiding him, even though I couldn't really avoid him. And uh, so, just two months after I, I published my anthology, the first anthology, I realized why I kept hearing of Baker. He had just published his next book, The Anthologist. Mm -hmm. And and so that was kind of the tipping point for me in the sense that you can have a literary tipping point. And, and, um, and that was the moment when I said, well, this, this writer's work bears on me in some way. It's about me. And, um, and I think that actually has a whole lot more to do with why we're, we, we pick the writers we read. You know, it's not just going to Oprah's list or having your professor tell you what to read. There's this mysterious and organic process that draws us to somebody. I don't think these motives are always the same. You know, I think when you're in a, a moment of crisis that you're probably looking for someone for the, the, kind of, the kind of writer who can let you plumb your own inner depths. And then other times you probably read outwardly. You read for those writers who can tell you about the outer world as opposed to your inner world. But particularly at that moment, that was what I needed. And it was a very mysterious process. And so that, you know, I was, and I recognized, okay, I need to read this guy, but what I should first do is I should first sit down and start writing about what I think I know about this guy. And because um, that was what nobody had ever done. I'd read a lot of these literary relationship stories, but no one had ever told a literary relationship story from that moment of conception, that moment when you first hear of somebody. And that's odd because we all go through that dozens or hundreds of times, but I'd never heard anybody describe that moment. And, and so that was the way in which I could take this familiar idea, the literary relationship story, and turn it into something new. Okay, that helps me a lot because I just, mm -hmm. I didn't know whether there were other authors in the back of your mind competing with that choice mm -hmm. or something, but it really sounds like he, he came to you in a yeah. sense. Yeah, well, Martin Amos was, was, was sort of there too, and he ah. plays a kind of background role in this book at a few different stages, and, okay. you know, but, but, uh, but not until much later. Okay, yeah. um, this, we have time for just one more question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I've really gotten out of this is um, the communication between the writer and the reader uh, with kind of like the publisher as the middleman. But ha do you think, do you feel like what Baker was has done with his books um, and his mode of communication through sex, uh, do you think that's effective? Sort of 
um, on its face value, it's about sex, but there's something deeper there. Sure, yeah. Um, so understanding that you may lose some people who don't see the deeper side and therefore critique it harshly. Well, you know, I think I think reading has changed over time. I start with a kind of scene with when when um, somebody at a reading poses James Salter the odd question, "What do you think the purpose of literature is?" And in Salter's kind of stumped, and you know, in response to that, and it was a bit of an odd circumstance, so it's not entirely his fault. But um, uh, you know, I, I think that that we are in a period when when we're not really sure what literature is for inside of a society anymore. It seems to be we, we're getting a little bit lost, and um, and you know I'm I'm trying to base this whole project. The the subtitle of the book is a true story of literary arousal, and 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 it has to do with the fact that there's long been this metaphor that reading is a kind of human intimacy for which there is no better metaphor than human physical intimacy. Right, reading is like sex, and. Um, that's everywhere. That's everywhere in history. It's from the Song of Songs. It's from Chaucer. It's in Chaucer. It's in, you know, it's in the Sontag's erotics of literature. I, I argue it's actually inside the phrase creative writing because Emerson's actually talking about reading at that moment and creative writing just sort of seems to be a tiny hitch step from procreative writing. It's, you know, two people coming together to make something beautiful, art out of nothing. The metaphor is right beneath the surface. Um, you know, there, it's even in, in, in websites like Bookslut, one of the very famous liter literary magazines, or Nancy Pearl's Book Lust. You know, we kind of toy around with this metaphor all over the place, but nobody had really sort of taken it as far as it could go. And even, like, as I suggest in, in, uh, in the section that I read, Baker's sex books, body as they are, seem to me to really be about reading. It's about that same metaphor. So as, as funny and campy and um, uh, explicit as they are, I think they're books that are really about reading. Uh, and they're about, you know, in so the case of Vox, for example, you have two people, they're telling stories to each other. That's another way of describing that book. Yeah, it's phone sex, but they're actively telling stories to one another. And they help one another. It's a kind of creative, co-creative storytelling process. And you only really need to dig just slightly beneath the surface to begin to see that. And what was amazing to me in looking at those books was the way that readers were resistant to do that, particularly those early readers. But I think that's what's going on in them. Thanks. All right, do we want to cut it off there? Uh, sure. Okay. The All right, book great. is B and Me. Yeah. Let's thank J.C. Holland. Thank you, everybody.